for Higher Education here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We're going to start, even though people are still milling around after, after Governor-elect Abbott's speech, but we've got to start because we all have a schedule here. Um, today I'm, I'm, I'm honored uh, to be joined by two esteemed panelists. To my immediate left is Professor Rob Coons, who teaches philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin. And to his immediate left is Bill Hammond, president of the Texas Association of Business. And I want to thank both of you gentlemen for appearing on the panel today. Our panel examines great inflation. As you saw from the title that we gave to this de demoralized zone. Well, what does that mean? First, let me give you some statistics on great inflation, which I suspect that you will find sh uh, shocking. Great inflation today has reached such a point that it constitutes a crisis in higher education. Over the past five decades, great inflation has been debasing academic standards and undermining morale. To begin to address this, legislation has to be passed that will make great inflation more transparent to students, to their parents, and to prospective employers. Now, the facts indicate the severity of the problem. In the early 1960s, 15% of all college grades given nationwide, 1-5% of all college grades given nationwide were A's. Today, 50 years later, the number of A's given has tripled. 43% of all grades given in college across the country are A's. In fact, an A is today the most common grade given in college across the country. 73% of all grades given in college across the country today are either A's or B's. As monetary inflation devalues the dollar, so does grade inflation debase the currency of education, student transcripts. It should therefore come as no surprise that grade inflation makes it increasingly difficult for would-be employers, and on this subject uh, we're fortunate to have Bill Hammond talk, it makes it increasingly difficult for would-be employers to distinguish truly excellent students from those who've taken courses and majors with lax standards. What the studies show is that grade inflation is the most virulent in the humanities, whereas the natural sciences and mathematics have done a better job of maintaining standards, although it has affected them also. As a result, and again as studies show, grade inflation has been found to disincentivize students from majoring in the sciences and mathematics, the natural sciences and mathematics. Right? At the same time that the country is crying out for more STEM majors, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, a couple of points here on the history of grade inflation um, and its causes. There are at least four. Grade inflation started to pick up in the 60s as a result of the Vietnam War. Um, at that time, to get a deferment, you had to stay in college. To stay in college, you had to maintain at least a C grade point average. And professors, not wanting to send kids to Vietnam, uh, graded higher. But Vietnam War ended 41 years ago. <laughs> Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, great inflation. Unfortunately, great inflation didn't. And, th and th that leads to the second cause of great inflation. The, the current format of teacher evaluations by students. Right. And uh, a, one of our panelists who is going to be here today, Valen Johnson, uh, wrote the book on, on, on great inflation. I mean that. He wrote a book called Great Inflation. Uh, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, he was ill, so, so uh, he can't be here today. But I'm going to uh, summar uh, uh, summarize uh, uh, the results of what he, what he has found. And one of his recommendations is that departmental evaluations of faculty 
should put more weight on how much students actually learn in the classes rather than on how nice the students feel by virtue of the fact that most of them are given A's and B's. So it's become a, a quid pro quo too often. Uh, stu his studies show students rate professors more highly on teacher evaluations if they get higher grades. Right. And so professors, the teaching evaluations play a big role in promotion, tenure, salary increases. And so the system as currently constituted incentivizes them right. to uh, uh, give higher grades. Uh, and, 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 and look, and none of this is sinister. This is not an accusation against them. Um, I was a professor for 20 years, and uh, the rule generally is, and, and I think uh, Professor Coons can probably uh, verify this, when you are first out of grad school, a freshly amended PhD, you tend to be the hardest grader. And then all of a sudden you find out that uh, you're in trouble, uh, and uh, uh, people are not happy, uh, including your department chair, if, you're, if your grade point average is too low. And that's the way it works. And so uh, you, you, find, you, you, you find yourself in, a, in what uh, is called a, you know, a prisoner's dilemma, right? Because if everybody else is grade inflating and you're just holding to stand, some sort of standards, all of a sudden students aren't going to be enrolling in your class as much. Right? So it's, it's, it's a real difficulty. The third reason for grade inflation, according to Charles Murray, who wrote a very small and very eloquent book called Real Education, which consists of what he calls four simple truths. Uh, none, uh, uh, but while they are simple truths, he says, you cannot say them in public these days. Uh, um, you know, the first simple truth is that ability varies. Uh, the second simple truth is that half the, half the students are always below average. The third simple truth is that too many students are going to college. And then the fourth simple truth that he articulates is that the future of American democracy depends on how we educate the truly gifted. Right? So going to his third simple truth, that too many students are going to college, according to Murray, with the college for everybody vision that began in the 60s, the result was that while perhaps 20% of high school graduates can truly handle a required core curriculum, the liberal arts and sciences, which was how education was always delivered until the last 50 years. Um, once that grew to now a third of high school students uh, 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 getting college degrees, what happened were a number of things. The new students that were being ushered in who couldn't handle a required core curriculum in the liberal arts and sciences, this helped produce the dismantling of a required core curriculum in the liberal arts and sciences, which has been replaced by its imposters, distribution requirements, general education, right? So that's the first thing. And then second, when you've got students in college who through no fault of their own, right, can't handle college work, but you want to keep them in college, if they deserve a D or an F, you're going to raise them up to a C. But then what do you do with all the students who belong? You're going to give them A's. So Murray says that this has played a part in, in, in promoting uh, grade inflation. And then fourth and last and perhaps most virulent is the effect of postmodernism in higher education. What does postmodernism mean? For our purposes, it means moral and cultural relativism, the denial that there are absolute standards. Well, lacking absolute standards for making judgment deprives one of the moral courage to take the heat when you give students the grades that they deserve. Right? You put all of those four causes together, and this constitutes the crisis of, of grade inflation. Now, when you look at the tripling of, of the percentage of A's over the last 50 years, it becomes even more egregious when you consider these facts. While A's have tripled in the last 50 years, during that same period, the amount of time that students spend studying alone in college has almost been cut in half. In the early 60s, students studied on average 24 hours a week alone. Today, they study on average 14 hours a week alone. Well, what has been the effect? Well, one of the effects, and you may be familiar with the landmark study of collegiate learning, Academically Adrift, 
one of the effects has been is this. Academically Adrift followed students from across the country for four years, public and private uh, institutions. And what it found is shocking. It found that 36% of college students today across the country after four years invested in higher education show little to no increase during those four years in, their, in fundamental academic skills, critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills. After four years in college. Right? So this is the situation we have. Students are studying half as much. 36%, it's as if they never went to college. Right? But these same students are getting triple the number of A's. Reformers look at this situation and proclaim higher ed a broken system. Now that's why we at the Texas Public Policy Foundation have been supporting a bill that was, that was introduced uh, last session called the Honest Transcript Bill. And all the Honest Transcript Bill would do this. It's a simple transparency bill would cost taxpayers no money. It doesn't ask universities to do anything differently from what they do now. All it asks is that they make transparent to students and parents and taxpayers what it is they're doing. All it would do is this. As you all know, on a student transcript, you have English A, math B, et cetera, each individual grade. Next to that individual grade on the honest transcript would be the average grade the professor gave the entire class. Right? Now, so prospective employers, graduate admissions committees, they look at this, if they see a student got an A and the average grade in the class was a B, that tells you something. If they see the student got a B and the average grade in the class was a B plus, that also tells you something. Right, just simple transparency. Now there are a number of people, Valen Johnson among them, who have come up with formulas that would actually push grades back to a more rational level, which I entirely support. Uh, but we're not gonna get there uh, right now. The first and only possible step, I think, is to make it transparent to everybody because most people don't know that this is happening and most people, you see a transcript with A's and B's, you think you've got a great student. Well, maybe you do, but you don't know right now because the really good students get lumped in with a good number of other students because of the effects of grade inflation. And let me just read a passage here from Valen Johnson's uh, uh, book. So I think he states, he states the issue very well. He says, a crisis exists. Current assessment practices are flawed, and both students and faculty know it. Unregulated grading practices change student enrollment patterns and penalize students who pursue demanding classes. They permit students to manipulate their GPAs, their grade point averages, through the judicious choice of their classes rather than through improving performance in those classes. Disparities in grading also affect the way students complete end of course evaluation forms of their professor's teaching performance and therefore result in inequitable faculty assessments, meaning that the professors who try to hold the standards are punished. As a consequence, academic standards are diminished. To right the boat, two things must happen. More principled student grading practices must be adopted and faculty assessment must be more closely linked to student achievement. And I think that, that, that Valen, Johnson, uh, uh, Valen Johnson says it well. And our hope here with the Honest Transcript Bill, should it be filed again this session, our hope is that it would pass because it would be the first step toward making the public aware of the problem. Because I think that right now there's a lack of awareness and this transparency bill, I think, would lift the veil from what's going on in higher education. Next, we'll uh, hear from Professor Rob Koontz. Thank you, Thomas. That's very helpful. 
Um, so I, I believe in higher education, spent my whole life in higher education, and I have, because of that I have many complaints about how it's done. I think there are lots and lots of ways in which we could do better than we are right now. But if I had to pick one thing to change, uh, this would be it, the great inflation problem, because this face, this, this poses a, an existential threat to the whole system, I think, in fact. And fixing it could make a revolution, could put, could put Texas in the forefront of uh, education reform. So that's why I'm really happy to be able to talk about the subject. Um, now, I'm going to uh, actually refer to a book that is the sequel to the book that uh, Tom just mentioned by uh, Joseph Aram and Joseph, uh, Josepha Ruxa, where they then followed what happens to college graduates after they leave college in the, in the first uh, two years after college. And uh, what they find is that, um, well, as, as, uh, as uh, Tom pointed out, I think uh, we, we, we like to believe in a Lake Wobegon world where everyone is above average, but of course, half the people are not. And so it's not enough to look at what happens to the average college graduate. You have to look at what's happening at the marginal graduate, college graduate, what's happening near the bottom. And there, unfortunately, the news is very poor, very bad. Uh, two years out of college, 7% unemployed, 3% working fewer than 20 hours, and 12% in essentially unskilled jobs jobs in which the majority of workers don't even have a single year of college. So that's a significant amount of un underemployment. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank measures it in a slightly stricter way, and they say that 44% of recent college graduates are in work that traditionally does not require a college degree, and even 33% of college graduates in their 30s are still in such underemployed situations. 24% uh, of recent grads still live with their parents, and 74% are still receiving financial aid from their parents. So, we're not doing well for our college graduates in recent years. College graduation in itself is a poor predictor of learning. So the problem is not that people who have learned a lot are doing poorly. The problem is that college graduation does not, in fact, correlate well with how much one has actually learned. And this is, here we look, look back to the book that uh, Tom did mention, the 2011 book about academically adrift. Using the collegiate learning assessment, which although that's perfect, it's been well accepted. It shows uh, good signs of statistical uh, reliability. And they find that nearly 45% of, of graduates shown, show insignificant gains in four years of college. One third did not improve by even a single percentile point. So in other words, if a student came in as a freshman and was in the 40 percentile, spent four years in college, took the same test with the same group of freshmen, they'd go up to the 41 percentile among freshmen after four years of college. This is one third of our current college graduates. The OECD did an international comparison of the US versus other countries and we found, found that we're well below average, despite having higher rates of college graduation than the other countries, any of the other, other countries in the survey. Now, why is this happening? Well, it's because, and this is something Tom also mentioned, because colleges increasingly demand only minimal efforts. And Tom already mentioned this, that we've gone from 13 hours a week to five hours a week of studying. I mean, think about that, five, uh, thir 13 hours a week. And here's the really crucial thing, 37% of college students in America today spend fewer than five hours a week studying outside of the, of the classroom. Okay, remember that number, because I'm going to come back and really shock you with another statistic in a few minutes, but 37 percent. And the question, too, I have to ask is, what kind of hours of studying are they doing? Is the TV off? Is their smartphone off? Are they playing video games while they're studying? Um, so I think it's actually, I think this understates the problem, in fact. Um, five percent, 50 percent, had not taken a single course in which they were required to do more than, than 20 pages of, of grading, of writing in that course. Uh, of all the European countries, only Slovakia was below us in terms of average number of hours that, uh, call, that students are studying. So it's, it's, a, it's really a serious problem. Now also, as, um, as I think um, Tom mentioned, uh, this low amount of effort is a result of soft grading and more importantly of low expectations. So I think, in fact, that great inflation is not the most important problem. It's only the tip of the iceberg. The real problem is work deflation. That is, it's the lowering of expectations from college students, which great inflation simply reflects. If students were studying as hard as they were before, frankly, I don't care if they're all making A's or not. But the problem is they're not studying as hard. They're not being challenged. They're putting in increasingly minimal efforts in order to get these degrees. And, uh, and it's interesting, as, as Tom says, one of the impacts of this is to drive students out of the natural sciences and engineering into other fields. Um, now, in, in fact, there's been great inflation in science, too. Natural sciences have just had much inflation, great inflation as the other fields, but they started from a much lower level. So there's been a 0.4 gap 
0.4 gap in the average grade between natural sciences and humanities from 70 years ago, and it's still true today. So it hasn't really changed. But nonetheless, uh, as the humanities grades get higher and higher, right, closer and closer to a 4.0, it's going to be really difficult for students to, to take that 0.4 uh, grade uh, gap in order to go into the, into the hard sciences. Now, why do we have these low expectations? Because I think 40 or 50 years ago, we went from a system in which, uh, there were, in which the system was hierarchical, in which there was a long tradition of a kind of feudal set of expectations which were put upon students, and we shifted to a consumer model, to a model in which colleges are designed to provide students with what they want. And what do students want? Well, they want not much work. <laughs> when, the, when, when you ask the average student, what don't you like about your worst professors? 50% said they expected too much work. So uh, if you go to a consumer model, it's not surprising that education, that universities are building more uh, lazy rivers that you can uh, tube on and Olympic gyms and climbing walls and fewer hours studying because that's what the consumer wants. And so that's what the consumer is in fact getting. Now what's the harm? Unrealistically inflated expectations, right? Students now from kindergarten through BA have been told that they're brilliant, that they're great, that they're doing fine, when they in fact aren't. They don't know what the heck they're talking about. And now they go into their workforce and they expect to be patted on the back again for having very little knowledge and that's going to hurt them. My concern is in fact that not only are we not preparing students for the responsibilities of adult life during those four years of college, we're actually de-preparing them or unpreparing them or what the we we'll have to introduce a new word here. They're actually less able to cope with the responsibilities of adult life after four years of pampering in the average college a day than they were when they, when they graduated. I think that's a serious problem. It deprives students of the, of the, of the uh, of knowledge about themselves, right? I mean, uh, going back to the Delphic or or Oracle and Socrates, know yourself, right? That's what education is all about. But if students are not able to get grades that reflect actual ability, then they're deprived of that ability to know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Where do I need to work? What do I need to focus upon? Um, so I think that, that there's, there's, there's significant harm. Um, it, 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 dis it, it provides disincentives to improve intellectually. And that has real consequences, because those who score low on this collegiate learning assessment actually have twice as much right, uh, twice as much probability of unemployment, 50% greater chance of being underemployed. So the CLA is actually measuring something that, that employers need. So the fact that, that so many students are not improving on the CLA is a significant, significant fact. Now, as I said, I think this represents an existential threat to higher education. Right? So let's just take the trends we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years and project them forward 20 years. I think it actually happened faster than that. I think it'll probably happen in 10 or 15 years. Imagine a future world where the number of A's is 65% of all grades, in which the number of hours spent studying falls to maybe six a week instead of 12 on average, right? in which 90% of students show little or no improvement in their cognitive skills. These are all just straight line predictions based on, on current trends. Right? Will such a system be able to sustain itself? Will students continue to spend $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 for an education that produces those sorts of results? I don't think so. Now imagine a different world, a different track which we could go on, in which, in which the number of hours studying climbs back to 20, or maybe even up to 30 or 40 hours a week of studying, in which 90% of students, instead of showing no improvement, so substantial improvement, actually maximize their intellectual potentials. In such a world, some students will, will be in the sciences, they'll be in engineering, they'll also be in the traditional liberal arts like philosophy and history and English. And in such a world, Texas would actually become the intellectual leader of our country. Right? All those uh, supercilious intellectuals on the East Coast and the West Coast, we would rub it in their faces right? that our students were actually a lot smarter than them in these traditional liberal arts and sciences. And I think that's doable if we can get a handle on this problem, if we can simply incentivize our students to make the most of these opportunities to improve themselves. But unfortunately, we're making the problem worse because we're focusing on graduation rates, right? How many people have acquired that little piece of parchment that says that they're educated? 
That's the wrong focus, right? That will actually exacerbate the problem because if you want to increase your graduation rates, the last thing you want to do is to raise their standards to make it more difficult for the students who are there to, act, to graduate in four years. Now, I'm not saying, that, I'm not saying that, that colleges will gain the system, right? They'll figure out some ways to get more people through. I'm just saying that they'll be encouraged to continue the current system, which, which is a continuing lowering of standards. Okay, I'm told I only have two minutes. Um, so here's the problem, right? We want to escape the Wizard of Oz fallacy, right? We don't want to suppose that just because you hand somebody a piece of parchment that says, you now are a doctor of thinkology, you have you've arrived, <laughs> right? What we want to know is what have students actually learned? And the right solution, I think, is to measure, to measure what students have learned after four or five years. In, in public policy, I think it's an iron law that you get what you measure. And right now, we are not measuring learning. And as a result, faculty pretend to teach and to students pretend to learn, right? But if we sit, create a situation where we actually measure what students have learned after four or five years, everything changes, right? I actually think, I mean, I, I'm okay with making uh, adjustments that try to, to fix the, the great inflation, but I think great inflation will solve itself if you provide the colleges and the universities the incentive to actually show results in terms of learning. Because then, of course, grades will be a tool to get people to work harder so that they will improve in four years so that your institution will succeed. Now, there are, there are many, many advantages to doing this. First of all, because useful tools already exist. We don't actually have to invent these things out of whole cloth. We can use the collegiate learning assessment. There's ETS proficiency skills. There's critical thinking assessment tests, there's GRE subject exams, and we could create some new things. We could create Oxbridge-like honors exams in some of the major subjects and use those to evaluate learning. Um, so, let me, so I've only got one minute. I've got 10 great advantages. So, uh, <laughs> all right, thanks. Uh, let, me, let me run through real quickly what would happen. So, so I think these should be low stakes exams for the individual student. That is, you don't want to say, here's a number you have to pass on the CLA in order to graduate. Because if you do that, you create political pressure to water down that standard so everybody can get over the, the bump. What you want to instead do is to say, we want your institution to show value added across the, ta across the board. We want you to show that the best students are doing much better, the worst students are doing much better, the average students are doing better, right? We want to show improvement across the board, right? And now it's still, I think it should appear on the student's transcript so that the future employer has some idea about how much progress you have made in those four years as an individual. Plus, it will motivate the student, obviously, to make, to make this kind of progress. So if we can reward reality rather than appearance, we can make much better use of our limited resources. Right now, I would say that at least half the money we're spending on higher education is essentially wasted, and that's what the, this information shows. If we, could, if we could take that money and repurpose it to, you, to, to programs that are actually working, we would see much better results. Universities would be motivated to raise standard and expectations, because otherwise, how are they going to improve learning? Graded deflation will occur as a natural consequence of higher standards. You don't need to come up with some kind of artificial device. Students will start valuing teachers and programs that enable them to maximize their own potential, not who make it easy and who are entertaining, right? And uh, that will change things. That will actually have a big imp impact on political correctness and on political diversity, too. Because if programs have to hire teachers who show actual results, they will have to hold their nose and actually hire conservatives occasionally if they're good teachers, right? <laughs> Whereas in the present system, in which basically we're all on a big party barge, uh, then you're free to hire any teacher that you want, and you might as well teach a higher one who, who fits into your culture, right? who agrees with your, with your wider uh, sort of leftist philosophy. So it will change political correctness. Students can be directed to programs and teachers with a proven record of success with similar students. Right? So if I know that my entering scores have a certain profile, that I'm coming from a certain part of the country or a certain ethnic background, and I know this program is, has proven results in helping people like me to succeed, then I'll go there. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, closing the gap between grades, uh, between the natural sciences and other subjects will mean that we have more students graduating. I mean, there's a real danger here. If we just say, produce more graduates, we could actually end up with fewer natural science graduates rather than more. Because if we do that by lowering standards in the humanities and social sciences, we'll end up with lots more humanities graduates and fewer hard science graduates. We'll get a better match of students to colleges uh, rather than the current mismatch, which often happens. We would actually save the humanities and liberal arts, I think. Um, and this is another big story I could go into, because the humanities are in real danger of extinction. And one of the reasons why they're in danger of extinction is that the humanities degrees don't have credibility. Whereas, in fact, the studies show that humanities and liberal arts degrees are actually very good at making improvement on these scores, better than business, actually. 
And if you had these kind of hard results, students would see that, and you'd have more philosophy majors and so on, which would be good for our country. Uh, and then finally, um, by raising the expectations for academic efforts, students will have less time and energy to spend on <laughs> drinking, hookup, culture, and all the rest. Um, I mean, I don't have the statistics here, but based on academic, uh, based on, um, uh, I just, in my impressions of different colleges, colleges, for instance, like Davidson, North Carolina, or Rice, where there isn't a lot of great inflation, or places where the students are working really hard and they have less time for drinking. Colleges where great inflation is rampant or places where there's lots and lots of drinking and lots of, lot of wasting time. So I think that's a root cause here that we could, uh, we could actually solve. Okay, I'm way over time, so thanks, thanks very much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Coons, and now we'll hear from Bill Hammond. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, something's bouncing around. I noticed it. Okay, well, I appreciate uh, the opportunity and I appreciate the partnership with uh, TPPF. Uh, like I said yesterday, uh, they think and we do. I think that's the difference between, <laughs> just kidding, between <laughs> TPPF and TAB. Um, first thing I would like to say is I wish this, uh, you know, since people are suffering from this uh, situation today, uh, I certainly would like to go on record as saying that I wish uh, people were suffering from this problem when I was in college <laughs> uh, because I, I don't remember great inflation being an issue uh, back in, when I was in school 100 years ago and uh, it certainly would have been helpful to me. You know, the other thing I'd like to say in, in defense of uh, enjoying oneself, you know, you said a few years ago that, or I don't know, maybe it's 20 years ago, I'm not sure exactly, but, you know, the average student spent 24 hours. Well, again, back when I was in school, people were taking, you know, 15 or 16 hours a semester uh, was the norm. Uh, if you add 16 to 24 hours of study, you have a 40-hour work week, essentially, and uh, that would allow plenty of time for uh, partying nights and weekends. I mean, if you just <laughs> made it an eight to five job, uh, obviously this is a critical issue uh, for employers across the state and for the state of Texas in terms of a uh, competitive workforce. You know, we, we work a lot on education, K-12 and higher ed both, and uh, for us, it, the issue is, you know, our job's gonna come to Texas. If we do not have an educated workforce, uh, jobs are not gonna come. They're gonna go elsewhere. Uh, and over the last few years during the Great Recession, uh, we've relied a lot on net in-migration from other states. Uh, the typical immigrants from the other states, not from the South, is, uh, you know, a profile of an educated, skilled worker who is valued and finds employment in this state. Uh, but if you look at the skills gap, I mean, across the board, today in Austin, Texas, there are 8,000 IT openings. Think about that. You know, this place is lousy with uh, IT graduates, but at the same time, uh, we don't have enough out there to fill the positions that are available. And there's all kinds of uh, poaching going on between, you know, employers stealing from other employers. Uh, and it's a major concern. And uh, believe me, it's across the board. I mean, the, the skilled trades, uh, which is not really the issue of this morning, but uh, the average plumber today in Texas is 55 years old. Uh, they're boomers, and they're not enough coming behind. So you have a combination of the uh, boomers generation. I think I'm probably the only one in the room who's old enough to be considered a boomer, probably. but uh, you know, you have, a, you have the, the rat and the snake, if you will, of the boomers. You have fewer numbers coming behind, and you have less skilled and talented uh, individuals in those groups. I mean, th this is an enormous problem, and I would boil it down. Uh, I think uh, Tom may have mentioned, I don't know, but I, I served in the House in the 80s. I'm a recovering member of the legislature. <laughs> I go to meetings on a regular basis. <laughs> and to me, the essential element that's lacking is the lack of desire or ability of elected officials to hold the institutions of education accountable for their performance at all levels. Uh, you know, at the, at the four-year level, at the community college level, they're cheerleaders. Now, it's human nature. It's understandable on the one hand that, uh, you know, if you're from Stephenville, Texans, you're gonna be supportive of the institution and your community. That is a good thing, but at the same time as stewards of the taxpayer's dollar, you should be interested in what's happening at that school. 
and I would disagree with the, the professor just a little bit on outcomes. I think outcomes are part of the measurements that need to be made. And, you know, at some point we do have to rely on the integrity of the system, uh, you know, but it's very much an issue. Uh, Tom and I have had this discussion. Uh, our approach is we need to do all of the above. In other words, we need to look at outcomes. We need to look at uh, these kinds of critically important issues. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues in the legislature last session on testing, which is kind of mixed in with this issue as well, in my opinion. Uh, basically, we have, we, we're blessed in our family. We have three children, all have graduated, all of are employed. Uh, everybody except number three is completely off the payroll, and we're working on a day-to-day -day basis with her. <laughs> uh, she is employed, but she's not completely off the payroll, and um, we're trying to get her that, to that point. But what I experienced as a parent was that uh, there was a deal that was made in high school. And the deal went something like this. If you show up for class, if you smile, if you complete these idiotic projects that these kids have to do, which are a pain for them and even more so for the parents, in my opinion, yes. pretty much worthless, uh, primarily designed to fill up time uh, in the day and in the classroom so the teaching doesn't really have to take place, uh, if you're building the ninth volcano of your K-12 <laughs> academic <laughs> career. Um, and then you're exempt from the test. You know, and the test is not an honest measure anyway. Because what do the teachers do where there's no um, formula or some standard or state outside, you know, ISO 9000 for learning? They create a test which is too easy and focuses on what was taught, not the curriculum. They teach what they like to teach. They talk about what they enjoy. They don't teach to the curriculum. All this worry about the curriculum. And so the test validates nothing. I mean, if you compare, we actually have an open records request with the TEA uh, to, to, and I think they have the data, but we're not, they haven't, they haven't told us yet, <laughs> that correlates uh, the grades that students receive in high school as to their test scores on the STAR exam. And I think what we're going to find out is the same thing that you guys know what's happening uh, at the college level. It's just not there. I mean, Tom has talked about uh, the transcript issue, which we support and uh, testified in favor of. And to me, it's a classic example. We were able to get it out of the house with the leadership of TPPF. All credit is due to Tom Lindsay uh, with regard to that. But what happened? It got over to the Senate. Did it get a hearing in the Senate? No. no. The establishment killed it. They don't like it. They don't like to be measured. They don't like to be held accountable. And legislators walk hand in hand with them and say, we love you, you're wonderful, and can you get me four extra tickets to the game on Saturday? And they do not hold them accountable. They are cheerleaders for the status quo. And what are the results of that? Well, you, you know, these guys who know a lot more about the issue and have researched it much more than I have know, but I know that the transcript, uh, you know, first place, we encourage employers to ask for the transcript. A lot of players, uh, a lot of employers don't even do that. But then when the data you receive from the transcript is bogus, uh, you know, the value of it goes out completely, completely out the window. Uh, there's no validation of learning. It's a certificate of attendance in far too many cases. Now, some skills, uh, which are obviously being hurt by great inflation, it's pretty clear, uh, the STEMs, uh, some of the others, where there is a certification, a test, accounting being an example, law being an example, doctors being an example, nurses being an example, on and on and on, you do have a validation. But for so many of the other subject areas, essentially there's no validation, there's no accountability or criteria to determine whether or not learning has taken place. So what the hell is employers supposed to do? Uh, you know, they're, they're put in an unfair position of trying to evaluate them uh, by the, uh, somebody sitting in front of them. And the, uh, no, I noticed the uh, issue of writing. Uh, nobody has to write anything anymore at all. I, I had an employer tell me he asked a prospect to bring writing samples from UT. Well, they didn't exist because he'd never done them. You know, he had never been asked to write a five-page or ten-page paper in his entire career at UT Austin. Uh, so, you know, no, no validation, uh, you know, no testing. One of the things I think that you've talked about is the idea of having some validation for, uh, you know, uh, 
the liberal arts in terms of is learning, you know, uh, is learning taking yes. place? Yes. Uh, are the students learning the material? Are they increasing their critical thinking skills? Just a simple, I mean, not that that's simple, but a standard of that sort uh, to pre and post uh, test to find out what the hell's going on. I mean, you, everybody in this room, are paying a substantial part of the cost of attendance, the parents, the kids, loans, on and on and on, yet it's not taking place. And, you know, even with great inflation, if you look at the four-year universities in Texas, the public schools, and you exclude UT Austin and A&M, College Station, less than 50% of our students graduate in six years, even given what has been presented to us today. You know, so they are spending a lot of money, the taxpayers are spending a lot of money, and nobody's getting any, any value. I mean, I, I agree with the idea that too many go to college. I mean, in the first place, a lot of them start, ought, ought to be, we ought to have a technical, skilled background for them, beginning a foundation, not a conclusion, but a foundation in high school, so they can go on to a community college and obtain skills and make a hell of a lot more money than a journalism major at UT Austin does. Uh, and a lot of the schools accept kids willy-nilly. I mean, I think if they were in the private sector, uh, the schools would be guilty of a deceptive trade practice because what they're doing is they're accepting kids who have virtually no chance whatsoever of actually successfully completing, even <laughs> given what has been presented to us this morning. Even with that, uh, they can't make it through. So, uh, you know, productivity, accountability, uh, if we're going to remain competitive, we're going to have to do a much better job. Uh, the skills gap is enormous. There are three million positions in America today that are not filled because of the skills gap. In Texas today, only about 34 percent of 25 to 35 year olds have any post-secondary anything, including a certificate, at a time when 60 percent of the jobs require skills beyond secondary. They require post-secondary certificates two-year degrees or four-year degrees and beyond. So uh, my time is up. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Thank you very much, Bill. And I want everyone in this audience to know that under Bill Hammond's leadership, the Texas Association of Business has been a strong and valuable supporter of strengthening standards in higher education, for which we thank you, Bill. Um, I just want to make a couple of points here, and I'll also uh, ask ask Rob and Bill if they want to make any additional points uh, before we turn it over to uh, to, uh, to questions. Um, Rob mentioned binge drinking, the binge drinking crisis on campuses. One of my interns last year, a college student, uh, when when the uh, there was an article about binge drinking and the problem, and and my intern uh, wrote an op-ed on it, and. The conclusion of the op-ed was this, why are college students engaged in binge drinking? Her answer, because they can. Uh, they can because drinking now starts on Thursday evenings, not on Friday. Uh, go to most campuses in the United States today and uh, on a Friday afternoon and you will think you're walking through a ghost town, right? And professors, they don't even schedule. Uh, classes on Fridays anymore because it's so hard to get student newspapers are even canceling publication of the print version of their papers on Friday because there's nobody there at a time right? they're begging for more money for facilities yes that's right yeah. that's right um, you know I ask I have interns every, every every semester and I've been asking them over the years about what they their, their opinion about grading standards etc and the most common response I get is it's a joke Right. Um, today, uh, through my EDU and through other uh, on-campus sites, when students, when students sign up for the next semester's courses, they pick the courses and then they get a readout that tells them the average grade that the professor gave for that course throughout the professor's tenure at the university. And as a result, when you, get, when you look at the suite of courses that you've chosen, if you don't like the grade point average of Professor B, you swap him out for Professor A. So it's a phenomenon that they call grade shop till you drop. And it's all done online, right? Um, 
Now, George Q, a professor who has studied all this, he explains this by what he calls the disengagement compact. And let me just read a couple sentences. Disengagement compact, he says, consists in this, quote, I'll leave you alone if you leave me alone, unquote. That is, I, the professor, won't make you, the student, work too hard, read a lot, write a lot, so that I won't have to grade as many papers or explain to you why you're not performing so well. The existence of this bargain is suggested by the fact that at a relatively low level of effort, many students get decent grades, sometimes Bs and even better, as we've seen. And Q concludes, there seems to be a breakdown of shared responsibility for learning on the part of faculty members who allow students to get by with far less than maximum effort, and on the part of students who are not taking full advantage of the resources that their institutions provide. Look, at the deepest level, Great inflation is a moral issue. Right. right. It's about integrity. It's about integrity. The first lesson of life, a lesson that is agreed upon by all the world's major religions and all the world's great philosophers, the first lesson of life is that life is difficult. Right? And that to be able to cope successfully with life's inevitable difficulties, we need to develop the qualities of character and mind that will help us not only survive but prosper this trial that is life. Great inflation teaches our students exactly the opposite. So I do not blame the students for studying less, for demanding higher grades. They truly are the victims. I blame the adults who are supposed to be in charge and who are supposed to be exercising leadership and who are supposed to have the intellectual and moral backbone required to insist on standards because they care about their students' success. A couple of other points here. Um, this bill that, that was proposed last year and that we hope will pass this year, the Honest Transcript Bill, it passed 137 to 2 in the House in 2013, but it would not be heard by the Senate Higher Ed Committee. Um, it, Dartmouth, Columbia, the University of Indiana, and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill have all adopted versions of this Honest Transcript Bill. Universities know about this. I mean, this proposal here is not from left field. There are universities out there that are, they are acting so courageously because, I mean, think about it. Until and unless we restore standards nationally, the ones who do hold the standards, right, they're gonna be at a disadvantage, right? It's the old prisoner's dilemma problem. See, that's why we think that instituting this transparency bill the Honest Transcript Bill that I mentioned in my opening remarks, and making it apply to all Texas public colleges and universities, that if this were to happen in the second largest state in the union, right, this, the ripple effects would be felt across the country. In, in a very short amount of time, what would come to be known as the Texas Transcript would, re would be regarded as the gold standard by both employers and graduate admissions committees. Now, an objection that's been raised is, well, but won't that put Texas students at a disadvantage against non-Texas students who don't have the average grade that the professor gave on their transcripts? No, it'd be exactly the opposite. Because an employer would say, I know what I'm getting with this Texas student, yeah. right? I know what this A means, or medical this B. Medical schools, law schools, too. In medical schools and law schools, too. I mean, the effects would be wonderful. And, you know, there are those who argue that this transparency, because this is just a mere transparency bill that we're asking for, that this won't have any effect, that students and their parents will continue to choose colleges based on amenities and football teams and, oh, right? Well, I don't believe that because it contradicts an article of faith for me, but it's an article of faith that I believe our democracy rests upon, and that is that the people, once informed about the truth of a situation, will see their way clear to remedying it. Right. So therefore, I think the very first step, the indispensable step, not the only step, not the final step, but the first step is to make people aware of this. When I wrote an article in the Austin American Statesman a couple years ago in which I said 43% of all grades given today are A's, PolitiFact did a massive uh, uh, expose. Uh, they went all over the country. And listen, to their credit, they were very honest about it. They rated it 100% true. Well, I mean, it's a fact. Right, but, but that's how shocking it was to everybody. You know, most people, they were in college 20, 30, 40 years ago. They remember there were standards, so they think, how bad can it be? 
The answer is very bad. You know, I, listening to you talk, I think, you know, uh, one of the real advantages of the legislation would be, and, I, you know, hopefully there are a lot of administrators out there who would like to see this happen, but we all know, all due respect, <laughs> that the uh, <laughs> professors are in charge of the institutions. I mean, it's like the hospitals. The doctors are in charge of the hospitals, let's face it, not the administrators. So, and, and there is hostility from the faculty, not this one, obviously, but in general, because this is a path of least resistance. You know, this is, this, like you say, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, we'll keep our little deal, everybody's happy, uh, but good things don't happen. So if this were forced on the uh, schools by the legislature, then the administrators can say, look, I hate this. I don't want to do this, but I don't have any choice. I've got to do it. Mm -hmm. So those staffers in the room who work for the senators, uh, go home tonight and figure out a strategy to get your boss to uh, file this bill in the Senate and get it heard. We're probably going to go back to the committee uh, the higher ed and education are going to be consolidated, it appears, in the Senate uh, next session. Uh, you know, we're going to have some fresh new leadership there, I think, from what we're hearing. Uh, you know, and I think there's an opportunity, and this is, this is a no-brainer. This is, you know, taxpayer fairness, parent fairness. I think it will help drive parents' decisions as to where they want their kids to go to school. Good point. Because what do they want? They want them to be a productive member of society. And if they spend $100,000 and they get a um, barista at, at uh, Starbucks after $100,000 because nothing was learned, they're going to be disappointed, but more importantly, the kid's going to be doomed to a life of poverty, really, as opposed to being a productive member of society. So I think this, uh, and I would just add quickly that I think there are other things that need to be done as well, but I mean, this is an important piece of the puzzle. I think those are good points. I would agree. Rob, was there anything you wanted to add? Um, no, I think you guys covered it pretty well. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm just surprised PolitiFax didn't, uh, didn't say it was pants on fire because it was 42.6%. <laughs> no, no, li <laughs> no, listen, I, I mean, you know, we complain about PolitiFact when we don't think we get a fair deal, so I need to give them credit. Yeah. They, they, they investigated it, and right. uh, yeah. uh, so uh, all, 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 all to the good. One final point I want to make, and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions here. Uh, Rob mentioned the collegiate learning assessment, uh, which, also, which TAB also supported, in right. addition to the honest transcript bill. We're hoping that that bill comes back also. Now, look, and I understand that, you know, we in Texas have been hearing about teaching to the test, right, and, and that's bad, et cetera. Um, the collegiate learning assessment is not a test to which you can teach. Or let me put it differently, if it were a test to which you could teach, everyone should be doing it. Because, right? right? Because all the basic material. Exactly. Teach the material. That, Writing it, and thinking. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that's right. regardless I mean, of major, critical thinking, complex reasoning and writing skills. Yeah. Right? You know, just quickly on testing, because we're advocates for testing, because there's no validation. There's no third party validation of what the hell's going on. And in K-12, we know it's not happening. Right. And even with the high stakes testing that so many people dislike, the passing score on the algebra one test, does anyone know what the percentage is you have to get correct to pass the test? Does anyone care to venture a guess? You all weren't here two years ago when we flew the Capitol, a banner over the Capitol trailing behind an airplane is to, to talk to everybody about what the percentage was? Anyone take, take a guess? 60, 40, 37% correct. Wow. That's the high, so-called high-stakes test that you have to pass to graduate from high school in Texas today. Yeah. Thirty-seven, and it's a multiple guess test. Hell, if you randomly select, you get twenty-five <laughs> percent. So I, I, I don't know. I'm not a tester, but I always figured that if you if you went through and you answered all the questions that you were absolutely certain you knew, and then you randomly guessed on the rest of them, you could get pretty close to thirty-seven percent with that technique. Yeah. I mean. Uh, you know, high stakes testing and what, you know, I mean, there's never any, you know, we never, we never shut down an institute of higher education, I don't think ever, regardless of how pitiful no. they no. are in terms of their productivity and completion is a measure, albeit, uh, you know, arguable, but, you know, if only, ha think of a business where they assembled enough raw material and labor to produce a hundred widgets, yet, they only produce 50 widgets a year. How long would that business last or stay in business? Yet, that's what higher ed is today. And not only with higher ed, 
not only is it the only 50 widgets a year out of the 100 potential, they get paid based on 100 widgets by the state. And half of those 50 are defective as well. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's even right. beyond. Right. 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 So, yeah. Yes. But, you know, if, if the experts say that, that these standardized tests don't work for higher education, then I'd, you would ask, have to ask all the graduate schools in the state why they use GREs, <laughs> why they use LSATs, all the medical schools. Right. Or why we have a exam, you know, why do we have, a, you know, law examinations, doctor examinations, yeah. dentists, on and on and on. Right. There are so many professions, nursing, uh, architecture, engineering. I do uh, think it's mostly the administrators, though, rather than the faculty that are trying to okay. this. Uh, because because you know the administrators have succeeded under the present system. Right. They're, they obviously are going to worry that maybe we won't succeed if another system is instituted okay. and has different uh, criteria. Good point. Well. And so they're very happy, very fat and happy <laughs> with the system as it is. Thank you. Let, let, we'll now open it up for questions. Uh, right. We have one over here. Rates of employment, employment. Gain, now yeah, gainful I've employment, right? Sixty percent verifiable graduates every year employed in the industry, and it's made. It, and I tell you, it's a big administrative burden on us, but it validates that I know that when my graduate is working in the field, they are doing the job that is that those employees are hired to ask them to do, and they're working Fridays and Saturdays. And you know what? I employ them. Well, you know, that's a great point. And, you know, I know uh, I was talking to someone at uh, another career college in El Paso, Western Technical College, and they've told me they have college graduates yes, who, are in, who are enrolling in their career schools right. in order to get training to get jobs. To right. pay back the loans that yeah. they took. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yes. right. College graduates going to career schools. Think about yeah. that. And I have a cosmetology school. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if we have statistics about default rates connecting with, with learning outcomes, but, but we do know that those who score low on the CLA exam, about a standard devi deviation below mean, have about 50% greater chance of being underemployed. So I'm guessing that the default rate is probably also at least 50% greater for that, for that group. That would make sense. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Go right ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And then we'll get you next over here. Um, that was an excellent point that you brought up, which made me want to ask a question to the panel. What would be the interest in requiring, this is just a thought that I haven't thought through much, so I want to just throw it out there, requiring college students to actually get an internship in the field or some work experience? Because what I'm seeing is students that get those internships, they get that practical application, and then they get the jobs versus the students who aren't getting work experience and they have to go to graduate school because the workforce is saying, we don't really know if you have what it takes to really work in here and you need to raise your standard. So what are your thoughts on incorporating that? Yeah. I, I, I think it would certainly be helpful. I mean, you know, the standards have become so lax that just about anything that connected students up with the real requirements sure. of life after college would be all to the good, Hannah. So I, I yeah, mean, I think that would be. As a matter of fact, uh, yeah. Travis Clardy, who may be chair of higher ed in the House, uh, has filed a bill that would give a tax credit to those companies that did an internship, $1,000. Uh, credit against the franchise tax as an encouragement to those who uh, do internships and provide mentoring for their uh, kids. Yes. You had your hand up? Are 
You're talking about the sports scandal? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. athletics. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you've gone to meddling. <laughs> yeah. Ath yeah, college athletics is like the third rail of Texas politics. Yeah, yes, right? the, yeah. I, I think it would be even harder here than in North Carolina to deal with it. Be might honest. be easier to change the course of rivers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 We're optimistic at TPPF, but even we know our limitations. <laughs> Walter had a question. Uh, yes, sir. I think internships are a great idea. I taught engineering for 42 years, and we a lot of our kids do get internships. It's impossible to require that, though, because there's no way for us to guarantee the company places to be able to do that. So it's strongly encouraged, but it's and in engineering it would be easier than many other areas. But even there, sometimes it depends on the economy. When the economy's good, then there are a lot more internships available, and the high percentage of the kids can get them. But when the economy's bad and people are laying off people, it doesn't make the people that are there feel very good when they lay people off and then hire summer interns. You know. well, that's a good point. You know, my only concern, I mean, and look, we are all rightly concerned about the workforce employability of college graduates. But I, I don't want to make, and we talked about the gainful employment rule, I don't want to make universities, I don't want them to be held hostage to the vagaries of the business cycle, right? Universities, sole responsibility, their highest responsibility, the most noble calling I know of, right, is to teach their students how to think and how to write. That's what we should measure, right? That's what we should measure, right? What happens in business will happen in business. But if you have critical thinking capacities, can engage in complex reasoning, and you have good writing skills, even in a bad economy, you'll do better than you would otherwise. I think that's where we should keep our focus. I'm afraid that we have run out of time here. If anybody has a short question, we might be able to entertain it. Otherwise, please join me in thanking our two panelists. Thank you for coming.